Okay, chapter three, the network components. In this chapter, we're talking about the different components such as the media, the network infrastructure, special, uh, specialized type of devices, uh, virtual network devices, voice over IP, as well as other components. So what are some of the characteristics of various media types? So the media types are gonna be copper, fiber, or wireless. What roles of a given network infrastructure uh, components? What features are provided by specialized network devices? How do we virtualize certain technologies and how does that impact the traditional corporate data center design? <laughs> That's always a fun question. And what are some of the primary protocols and hardware components found in a voice over IP network? So again, media. The network that allows for communication of bits falls in three areas. Copper, fiber, or some type of wireless type technology. Wireless could be anywhere between radio waves and Bluetooth to satellite and microwave. Copper could be coax, could be twisted pair. Fiber could be glass or plastic polymer. And then again, each one of them is uh, subcategorized into their own specific uh, categories. Copper. Copper cabling has been the most uh, common and widely used for communication mid 80s. Uh, Telegraph's been one of the first examples. Coax, unshielded and shielded twisted pair. And again, each of those have separate categories as well. So let's look at coax. Coax is always a good one because our coax has a solid copper core, then there's some type of cladding or insulation, then uh, a braided mesh, sometimes copper, sometimes foil, sometimes something else, and then some type of outer protective jacket. And this allows the sending of electrical impulses through this one wire at specific frequencies. In coax, we're looking at three major types. RJ6, which is normally used by cable companies to connect individual homes. RJ58, which that's the type for our thin net ethernet. 59 is typically used to carry composite video between two nearby devices, example, a cable box and TV. So RJ6 is gonna be thicker and more insulated. Connectors could be a, a, like a, some type of BNC or an F connector. An F connector is a screw-on connector, and a BNC is more of a, a push-in connector. It screws in a little bit, but not the same as a F connector. Twisted pair comes in multiple different types, shielded and unshielded. It sends a electrical impulse down pairs of wires. And this uh, twisting actually helps reduce electromagnetic interference, or EMI. We have shielded twisted pair, which would actually provide a shield per twisted pair. And we also have unshielded twisted pair. Examples of twisted pair would be uh, this guy. You're going to have four pairs, so eight total cables with a uh, normally some type of plastic in between, as well as uh, some type of copper separator in the center. Now the nice thing is with this category six or the cat six cable, this provides some resistance. So it's not totally immune. Going on, there is cat seven. Again, four pairs of insulated copper wires and then there's insulation around that, and this becomes very resistant to EMI. So the important one here, uh, I'm not gonna totally agree with uh, this throughput chart, but for the most part, it, it's okay. Cat3, Cat5, 5E, 6, except here, Cat6, certain distances can do 10 gig. 10 gigabit per second. Cat 6A does do 
10 gig, cat 7 does do 10 gig, and again, almost all of them are 100 meter, and that is pretty standard. So, the mail end of the cable, or the actual termination of that cable, is going to be an RJ45. There are four pairs, eight pins, and they terminate into a jack. Very similar to an RJ11, which could be four or six pin. Next we have an RS232, or nine pin, or serial connector, or DB9. And this is normally used to connect things via serial port. Fiber optics, normally a, an LED or laser, some type of light emitting diode, be an LED, that will transmit data through a fiber, whether it be glass or plastic polymer. Two major types, multi-mode and single mode. So multi-mode fiber, MMF, the actual core size is 62.5 microns and it's normally used between devices like servers, pin switches, router and switches. Multi-mode is not made to go as long distance as single mode fiber. Multi-mode fiber, the light will propagate over multi-mode fiber optic cables as opposed to single mode fiber SMF 10 microns normally again between routers and switches or long distances here we have the light propagation over a single mode fiber optic cable no actual critical angle that's just made to travel down the center. So now we have to think about how we connect them. Common connections for fiber optic is an SC, which is more like a square, ST, which is like a B and C, but it's more of a twist, LC, and MTRJ, or Mechanical Transfer Register Jack. SC, ST, and LC are very common, and they don't come as an individual wire, they come as pairs. Like you'll notice our LC, there's two strands of fiber. Our SC, again, there's always two. ST, again, there's always two. Even though the photo only shows one, these come in pairs. One for sending, one for receiving. Advantages, higher bandwidth, better distance, immune to EMI, since there's no electricity, and security. Advantages of copper, easeability, less expensive, and tools. Cable distribution. We have to talk about things like entrance facilities, uh, main distribution frame, cross connects, IDF or the intermediary distribution frame, backbone, telecom closets, horizontal work, uh, working and wiring, and work areas. So, let's look at our cable distribution. Horizontal cabling should be the actual wiring going horizontal. Work areas is the areas that we work. Vertical is going to go with vertical between floors. Cross connects may connect multiple wiring closets together. A intermediate distribution frame or MDF is the primary versus a IDF which would be a backup. We, we may have one primary wiring closet and the primary ones will then chain off to intermediate ones. Cable distributions could be a, a 66 block for phones or maybe a 110 block patch panel or connections. Here we actually connect like a, our workstation to an outlet. That outlet actually funnels through the wall and should terminate in some type of wiring closet by a way of some type of patch panel. That patch panel then will connect to a switch and then to other pieces of equipment. 
that way, that outlet will always connect to that patch panel. Documentation, connectivity, all of that's easier when you follow that type of standard. Wireless technologies. We have wireless clients that connect to a wireless access point, and that wireless access point will be hardwired to some type of switch so that we can actually communicate with the physical network. Network infrastructure devices could be routers, could be switches, could be hubs, but the two main categories are routers and switches, and we need to understand how these things work. Before we talk about switches, we need to, we need to understand what a hub is. And a hub is a layer one repeater. Basically, it takes the signal and it clones it. There are three basic types of Ethernet hubs, passive, active, and smart. But again, essentially in today's network, hubs don't exist anymore. With a hub, we have one collision domain and one broadcast domain, meaning because these are just multi-port repeaters, anything that goes to one port truly goes to all ports. Next, we have bridges. So these join two or more LAN segments together. Each LAN segment becomes a separate collision domain, and the bridge will analyze source MAC addresses and make forwarding decisions based off of that. So a bridge, we're still at layer 2, so we still have a single broadcast domain, but that bridge will separate collision domains, meaning it will not forward collisions, it will not forward communication at the same time. Switches. Switches operate at layer 2, and they are a multi-port bridge. They learn MAC addresses and they make forwarding decisions based off of the MAC address. They analyze source MAC addresses in frames, entering a switch on a particular port to build a MAC address table. Here, each port represents a collision domain, meaning two devices communicating at the same time will not interfere with one another on a switch. So again, still uh, layer 2, so one broadcast domain, but here each port is a collision domain. Next, routers. Routers are a layer 3 device. They make forwarding decisions based off of IP addresses. They make path selection. Here, each port on a router is a separate collision domain, and a separate broadcast domain. Routers typically are more feature rich uh, and have a lot better functions and features on each port. Here we have two broadcast domains, one on each side of the router, and again each link between the switch is going to be a collision domain. Now Switches are kind of special because switches can be both layer 2 and layer 3. Layer 3 is path determination or path selection, not just simple forwarding. So a layer 3 switch can make decisions both off of a MAC and an IP address. We can also configure virtual LANs and this will allow for multi-network uh, communications or inner VLAN communications. But we're going to get more into VLANs in Chapter 4. Here, with a multi-layer switch, as long as these ports are acting like a Layer 3 port, each port is going to be a broadcast domain as well. So, infrastructure device summary is a hub will have one collision domain and normally one broadcast domain operates layer 1. Bridges and switches, one per port, one broadcast domain and operate at layer 2. Multi-layer switches, one per port, one per port for broadcast and they operate at layer 3 or layer 2 depending on 
the switch port mode you have it set in. Router, one per port, one per port for the broadcast, and again operates layer three. Okay, so now let's talk about some specialized network devices. That's going to be things like a VPN concentrator, or a firewall, or servers, or maybe content engines and switches. Because there's more to a network than just the infrastructure. More than just routers and switches and PCs. We have other devices that serve specific functions. So a VPN. A VPN concentrator is what allows things to connect multiple VPNs into a, a network that better or more efficiently manages those VPN connections. So a VPN by itself is a virtual private network and it creates a secure virtual tunnel uh, between one network through another network. So uh, for example, we could tunnel through the internet between two locations so that each location could have secure LAN communication between each location. Uh, the, the VPN tunnels normally connect from some type of an initiator back to a concentrator and it's normally through some type of firewall but it doesn't have to be. So here we can actually have our VPN terminators at each location and they'll terminate to one another. That way if we have someone at branch A they could communicate with things at HQ. Now A could communicate with branch B through the tunnel but it'd have to go through HQ first. Next is a firewall. A firewall is primary a network security appliance and it basically stands guard or prevents traffic that wants uh, to be blocked. So the administrator could block certain traffic and the firewall would actually prevent that traffic from coming in. You could also look at having it scan for malicious material malware and viruses uh, in the packets as they're coming through it. That's called deep packet inspection. Now firewalls could be a hardware or a software. It could be based on the network or based on a host. Just kind of depends. So normally our firewalls sit at the edge of the network and everything it funnels through it. It normally will block any request coming from outside in unless something on the inside originally initiated the request. Meaning, normally the outside is not allowed into the network unless something on the inside of the network requested it. DNS, domain name system, it is a function or a service that allows us to translate between IP addresses and domain names and back and forth. So if we go to google.com, DNS looks up the appropriate IP address for Google and then routes it accordingly. Without DNS, our internet would not really function because we don't remember IP addresses, we remember names. So DNS is what allows us to do that because again, domain name to IP address and IP address back to domain names. That way we can access a resource via its name. Normally each PC will have a DNS server and if you're trying to go to google.com or here the example is ciscopress.com you don't know where that IP is at or you don't know where that domain name is at so first you have to query a DNS server that will translate the ciscopress.com to an IP address and then once you have the IP address it will forward it to that IP address. There is a structure. The very top of the structure is called root and then underneath root is all the subdomains .com, .biz, .info, .net, .edu and then underneath each of those domains extensions will be like cisco.com, amazon.com because they're all underneath the .com. 
if we're looking at dot mil, Navy, Air Force, Army, if we're looking at dot edu, that's going to be all the schools like csn.edu, unlv.edu, all of them will fall underneath that edu extension. Next should be our DHCP server, and that is so that we do not have to manually or statically assign addresses. This DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, will automatically hand out IP information to our hosts, thus allowing us not to have to manually set it. You can include things such as an IP address, a subnet, a gateway, and a DNS server when setting up DHCP. So there it's a four step process. First the PC comes online, we'll do a DHCP discovery. Basically it sends a broadcast trying to find the DHCP server. DHCP will offer, it will say here the suggested IP. Then the third step, DHCP request from the PC. It will say I'll accept this IP address. And then the last step, step four, DHCP ACK. That will have the DHCP server acknowledge that that is now your IP address. Proxy server. So proxy server is just a way to forward traffic. Instead of a direct path, we could send it through a proxy. That proxy could be in another country, could be a different region, but we could have our traffic forward through a particular proxy. Thus that traffic would look like it's going from somewhere else. An example would be setting up a proxy server and that way we will communicate through the proxy and so outside will only ever see the proxy and never us. Content engines and switches. This allows us basically to help filter. So the content switches are also known as a load balancer. This allows us to better keep certain addresses and information current. For example, if we keep going to Google, maybe this content engine will actually keep google.com cached so a little easier to respond. Content engines sometimes are also used for filtering, but there is a dedicated device out there called content filters that will filter traffic based off certain criteria, such as the school may now ban pornography being viewed. The content filter will actually then filter out all pornography. Here's our content engine. Content switch is very similar except it's done at the switch level. Virtualization. So if we're looking at lots of hardware, we could actually virtualize several servers onto one physical server. That one physical server has to have a lot more resources, but it could better utilize the services that are there. I have several videos on virtualized servers, so if you want more details, check them out. Virtual servers, again, it could be virtual components, virtual hardware, virtual software, virtual networking equipment. Last topic is VoIP, voice over IP. So in this regard we're taking our traditional voice traffic and now we're digitizing it and sending it over a data network. So we're getting rid of our traditional PBX solutions, so no more traditional phone systems, and we are going through some type of database or data driven PBX on a data network. Normally we call this a call manager. So the call manager is actually going to be the data PBX and that's what's going to handle our calling. And that is going to the IP phone comes online it will communicate through the call agent to allow communication through a gateway. And normally this is done through 
sip. And this is just an iterative voice, but this is just one way of doing it, as opposed to having a dedicated PBX and analog load systems. SIP stands for Session Initiation Protocol. RTP stands for Real-Time Transfer Protocol. And PSTN is a public switch telephone network. POTS is just a plain old telephone system. That way we have some basic understanding of what VoIP does and the different specific components. And that is it for this chapter. I want to thank you.